uh, I won't try to pronounce her last name because I'm going to destroy it. Uh, Emma is both a Canadian research chair and an industrial chair. Uh, she worked with a, a railway company. Uh, she was funded by the, the Canadian National Railway Company. Uh, Emma works on machine learning and optimization for large-scale decision-making. Does that ring a bell? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she has a PhD from EPFL in Switzerland. And also, uh, she was a faculty at KT KTH in, uh, in, uh, in Stockholm before uh, going to Montreal. In Montreal, she is also part of the uh, of Ivado. She's a I forgot the exact title, but let's say a senior advisor of Ivado, uh, which is an organization we are collaborating with. And finally, last but not least, she's part of the external advisory board of AI Forum. So we have to be very kind with her. All right. So Emma, we both further ado. Uh, I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you go. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice to see you. Um, first of all, uh, I will uh, say thank you for the invitation already right now. it's uh, It's been quite good to be in Atlanta, as you can see. Uh, so we kicked off with, with research discussions and biking. Um, and it's a lot sunnier than warmer and warmer than in, in Montreal. So very happy to be here. Um, I think some of you were uh, maybe attending the talk of Robin, so uh, you could see the first slide, uh, Robin Legault, who is my former student and really who is was leading this work that I'm going to present today. And so he did like this super short presentation at Informs of like 13 minutes. I think Lizzie you also did that. So hopefully it will not be boring, even if you intended. Um, uh, that talk because I certainly hope I can do more in like say 45 minutes than he could do 13. Um, so before going into the the core topic, um, I would just like to uh, spend a little bit of time on why I'm interested in this uh, problem that I'm going to talk about. So uh, in the real world, and I think this audience, I don't really have to uh, convince you uh, that problems Many of the problems that are interesting in practice are large scale, uh, typically discrete optimization, and they are subject to uncertainty. So I'm especially interested in supply chain problems and transportation problems. And uh, these, uh, these problems, I would argue, so what I'm arguing here is that they are uh, subject to uncertainty. And even if we work a lot on the machine learning side and we have you know, very, uh, even if we have rich data, good models, good algorithms and so forth, um, it's unlikely that we will get rid of this uh, uncertainty for the types of problems that I'm interested uh, uh, here today. So one of the, uh, the reasons is a long planning horizon. Uh, so the problems here are uh, strategic and tactical planning. Uh, and so the longer the runs in, the more uncertainty, obviously. And something that I've been working a lot on and that I'm really interested in is um, an important source of this uncertainty, which is demand. And so people have different preferences. They can have different constraints, like think about budget and so forth, uh, which means that uh, it's hard to predict demand, okay, because of, of these heterogeneous preferences. Moreover, uh, we often see seasonality. Uh, now seasonality per se is not really an issue. Uh, but more and more, we're seeing volatility in the data, right? So before one could see peaks and there were like these standard sort of uh, uh, patterns that one could see and one could deal and, and with and predict. Um, but uh, different aspects are making demand more volatile. For instance, the influence of social media. So if we think about supply chain problems, the demand for a certain product can suddenly sort of increase just because some influential person on on social media uh, has written about it, right? So it's becoming increasingly volatile. <laughs> Other sources are really uncertain as well, and I will not spend time, I'm really going to focus this talk on demand, but costs we're seeing also increasing sort of uncertainty. It can be due to a, uh, a political situation which impacts costs, uh, but even more we're seeing also with weather changes that can impact you no know, infrastructure, which in turn uh, impacts costs. So modeling demand is really challenging, right? So uh, oftentimes when we talk about uh, data that we have, um, the data is constrained by whatever demand 
So whatever supply and prices and so forth that were put in place. And typically we observe demand as demand that was actually realized at a given point in time, right? So it means that that, that demand that we observe is constrained by whatever was offered at that particular point in time, okay? But now if I'm interested in a strategic or tactical planning problem, I may wanna change that supply. So then the question becomes, what is the demand if I'm not going to change that reality? Right, And uh, oftentimes then we need to go out of distribution with respect to the distribution that of demand that we saw from the beginning, because many times we have not been sort of seeing a lot of different policies implemented in the past. So if you think about sort of, I'm going to talk about facility location, oftentimes there's not been a lot of different sort of configurations of facilities in the past, which means that the data is constrained to one or a few policies, right? Uh, so that means that we're often using simple distributional assumptions where we're solving problems. But if you look at the data, even within the sort of restrictions that we have in the data, um, those simple uh, distributional assumptions are, are usually not true, right? So we want something that is flexible, um, and uh, that can sort of uh, have good out of distribution generalization. And as a last note, which I'm not really going to talk about is sort of these, just characterizing these distributions is usually hard because we're also having sort of small data because if we have a lot of history, most of the history oftentimes is not really relevant for where we are today, right? So I'm not going to talk about how we actually get those distributions, but what I'm going to talk about is how can we um, have um, less or weaker assumptions on the demand distributions than what is in the literature. So that was sort of for the context on the demand. So what we want to do is that we want to solve large scale tactical or strategic planning problems, ultimately, so this is my long term objective, subject to endogenous demand distribution. So here I mean with that the distributions are decision dependent, right? And um, what we're going to talk about today is that the demand is going to be assumed, uh, we're going to use random utility maximization models. Who have heard about random utility maximization models before? Ring a bell to anyone? No, okay, so I have a slide that gives some context. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about a, a competitive facility location problem, which I see sort of as a, as a playground problem for this but it's going to be specific to that class of problems. Okay, so for the outline, I'm going to define this problem class that I'm interested in and some of the related work. And I'll also provide some background on what is random utility maximization model, okay? Then I'm going to present uh, our approach with this a generative perspective. So I'll, I'll explain to you what I mean by that. And I'm going to present a method which is called simulation-based hybrid Submodular method that we called it. So uh, we can show that it generalizes some method from the from the existing literature. And what we'll end up with is actually an algorithm uh, that does not uh, depend on sort of hyperparameters defined by the user. So it's going to be an algorithm completely uh, without uh, user-defined parameters. And then there is an extensive numerical study. Um, and I'm going to give some hints about the results that are in the paper. So the paper is on RCAB, it's relatively fresh. Uh, and uh, this is the first time I'm presenting this work. So let me see how I'll, I'll do on time. Okay, so what is the choice-based competitive facility location problem? So I hope that you can see that th this is in, in grayscale, but I'm going to explain to you the problem with the help of this figure, okay? So uh, you see, do you see triangles? Okay, so there are triangles in this figure. These are locations that we're interested in. And our problem is to maximize the expected market fair share of a new firm that entering an existing market. So you have triangular uh, triangles, which are uh, the locations of competitors, okay? Um, the competitors, oh, they are not actually in, in uh, triangles, it's the diamonds. So black diamonds uh, like these, we can see that in the plane here, we have a distribution of locations that are of the competitor, okay? 
Then this is like an example of a solution. So you can see triangles in two different shades. One is white, which is an open location. So we've chosen to open it. And you can see those that are in gray, which are closed. We have decided not to open them in this solution. Then you see a ton of circles, okay? So these ones represent customers. Now we wanna capture customers as much as possible, right? Through our decision of locations. And so the color of the customers uh, is ref reflects their probability of capture, okay? So this is where the stochasticity comes into play. So depending on our location, we have a certain probability of capturing the, the, the customers, so each given customer. If the circle is very dark, it means that our probability of capture is very low, okay? And the brighter it gets, the higher the probability that we will capture them. <laughs> so you can see in the upper uh, left corner, there is mostly competitor locations, right? You see these diamonds, which are black. And then you see that the customers, they are mostly black. So these are very likely to be captured by the competing facility, okay? And where you see that we have customers that are close to the white facilities here, they are whiter, so the probability that we are capturing them is higher, okay? And in this case, the probability of capture depends most on the distance to the facility. But there can be, there can be different attributes that will determine this. Um, so customers, this probability comes from the fact that customers, they want to select the alternative that maximizes their utility. So we assume that there is utility associated with each location, so which is an alternative for them. And uh, this just reflects that probability. Is the problem setting out? Okay. And what is the gray triangle? Sorry if I, if I missed it. The close location. They, they are closed locations. So I have a set of locations which I can choose to open or not, right? So the locations that I can choose to open or not is the union of these triangles in this figure. Okay. Uh, so the probability of the capture is depends on the divisions. It's, it's depends on the division you made. Yes. Yes, so through, and this is a very important point, and that's where the endogeneity comes to play that I was measuring. So this, this, the probability of capture is a distribution, right? So through my decision, I'm going to impact that distribution, okay? And if the only thing that matters is the distance to the, uh, to the location, that will be the key point uh, impacting, right? So since, through my decision, I will impact the distance to the customer. I will impact this probability and the distribution. Okay? Because if this slide is not clear, then I'm in trouble for the rest. Okay. So we can form this, uh, this problem. Um, as a maximization problem, remember, we want to capture as much demand as possible. And uh, the uh, expected market share of this demand is hence uh, um, the expectation over this problem that the users are maximizing, right? They're maximizing random utility. Um, so the argmax that you're seeing, um, this argmax here is the user problem, right? They are maximizing their utility and this U of C is uh, random, okay? Here it's written in a very general form. So you're seeing um, three um, random vectors, the theta, which define the customer attributes and every, anything related to the, the features, if you wish, of these alternatives and the customers. Then you have the betas, which are uh, parameters, right? So if you're doing machine learning, you would estimate uh, these uh, values from data. And then you have the error terms, the epsilons, which defines the distribution of uh, the demand, okay? And so you can see here uh, the question uh, that you had. So here, my binary decisions on the locations are X. I can have budget constraints here. And you can see they're dependent on X because it impacts the options that are available uh, to uh, the um, uh, to the uh, customers, 
So C of X here is the union of the available locations that they can choose from. So it is our uh, locations as well as the competitor locations. Um, and what we are interested in is all of the utilities that we can capture by our locations. Okay, so this is a very general formulation. Okay, so now let's see. Um, I haven't talked to you about anything about these specific random utility models yet, right? And actually what you will see is that these types of problems, the solution methods in the literature really depend on the assumptions that you make, especially on these epsilons, okay? So they're very specific to um, specific types of models. So this is just a slide because I was anticipating that maybe many of you don't know about random utility maximization models. So I think that no, I, I actually picked this from another presentation, but I think that notation is relatively close to what we had before. So essentially all alternatives have utilities, okay? We assume that they are additive. So I'm talking about additive random utility models. So you have some deterministic term here. You have those parameters beta times the features theta that I talked to you about. It doesn't need to be linear in parameters, but here I assume it is. And then you have your random terms. That's our utilities. The probability we get by comparing utilities, and this is important, right? So the probability of a given alternative is the probability that that utility is higher than all of the others, okay? That's how we go from utilities to probabilities. So then you can see that I need the cumulative distribution function here to determine that probability. So it will be given depending on the assumptions that I do on the epsilon. Now it turns out that if I assume that the epsilons are IID extreme value, you can forget what extreme value distribution is if you wish, but that is a very nice distribution that gives me an expression that probably you recognize, which is like a softmax, okay? Um, now, if you look at that uh, probability, even in the very simplest case, which is a logit or logistic regression, you get the sigmoid function, so it's nonlinear. But what is important, and we will get to that later, is that comparing utilities, we can do in a linear way, okay? So this is something that is used for sample average approximation. So switching from the probability space, which is nonlinear, to the utility space comes at the cost of simulation, but then everything is linear. Okay, so now if we get back to the general formulation of our problem, can you see in the back? Okay. Um, you can see that when we're writing this probab uh, the probability here, um, we are comparing utilities. Okay, so we're writing this in utility space. So one can actually view these from two different perspectives. We're going to take the generative perspective, but most of the literature is taking a conditional perspective. So in a conditional perspective, you're going to assume that you have observed individuals, right? So you have a set of individuals or customers, uh, here it's capital N, having some attributes, and you're going to say, this is my set of customers, okay? And it's, 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 it's considered fixed. And so you have some empirical distribution of all of the features that matter, right? Then you can formulate these, uh, this problem. This is exactly the problem that we saw earlier, but I made it specific to different models. So this one is just the loaded model that you recognize from before. If I assume that I have uh, random uh, vectors uh, beta in here, it becomes a loaded mixture, what we would call, okay. Now, Obviously, my, the population is larger than my sample, right? So how do we deal with that in conditional uh, perspective? We will have weights, right? So what is the weight represented by this sample individual or customer N? And we would include that here, okay? Now, if I have a generative perspective, we can just say, okay, we're just assuming that customer attributes, these uh, theta ends, they are modeled as random variables, right? And then we just want to maximize market share. And so what we want is to maximize this market share with respect to the joint distribution of random vectors. So here we're assuming that theta, beta, and epsilon are random vectors in the most general case, okay? And then we just 
assume that any sample we have is generated from this. Make sense? So then you have the generative perspective on top. They look uh, very similar, except for uh, these weights. Um, and that we always have in here an integral with respect to these random vectors beta. OK? So if we look at what is done in the literature, most deal with this uh, conditional perspective from before. And we're going to show that the general, uh, the generative perspective generalizes those. Um, the state of the art, there is one exact method, which is currently the state of the art by Mai and Lodi from two, 2020. They are proposing a multi-cut outer approximation algorithm. So it's MOA, multi-cut uh, outer approximation. And you'll see it in the results earlier. This is going to be our exact benchline, benchmark. And then there is an heuristic method by Dam et al. from 2022. Uh, so uh, we will call it GGX for greedy heuristic gradient balanced local search and exchanging. So essentially, it has three phases. It has exactly those three phases, and it's heuristic. So these two are going to be our uh, benchmarks. Even though it's not the state of the art, I wanted to mention the sample average approximation that leads back to Hase uh, in 2009, in 2009, sorry. Um, so this is really the idea that I said earlier. So you can sample utilities. So they were the first to observe that actually I don't need to deal with these probabilities. I can just sample utilities, right? So essentially what you're doing, drawing is that you have a conditional perspective. So you have some sample of individuals. And then for each, you're drawing scenarios. If your betas are random, you would have scenarios from the betas. If they are not, you will only sample these random terms, right? So then you, for each of your individuals, you will, you will sample sort of uh, scenarios. And then you will just do pairwise comparisons of these uh, utilities. And you will construct the sample average approximation of your problem. OK? Now, the issue with this and what we're going to spend some time on is that you require s, so the cardinality of s to be very, very large. So we want to get rid of that. OK, so this is sort of an overview of what exists. And you can see that it really, so there is one column per type of random utility maximization model. Since it's not uh, your passion, I'm not going to say exactly. <laughs> it does not seem to be your passion, at least not yet. Uh, but essentially, these depend on the assumptions that you have on the random utility maximization models. And you can see that the last column is that you just say anything. And with any rock, it's important to come uh, to note that these are very flexible models. When you go and you have a loaded mixture, it can approximate any uh, random utility maximization model. So it's a very sort of flexible way, and you don't necessarily need to have linear utilities, which makes these very, very uh, flexible models. Right? And so the only ones that can deal with that if you construct the sample average approximation, which unfortunately does not scale well, and uh, what we are suggesting. And what is important to note, all do not need, obviously, to sample, to sample right? So the others are sort of working on uh, using the structure of the, of the, of the model. Um, but if you have random attributes or if you have random beta parameters, all of these would require simulation anyways, right? So it's not that the um, simulation is not needed for in the general case. Okay. Questions so far? Okay. So I get into what we suggest to do. And so um, it was a while ago since I gave such a technical talk. I hope it's not, it's okay. So I tried to just uh, give you the outline of what we're going to do. Okay. So I'm going to uh, go from this general formulation that I showed you earlier, the generative one. And I'm going to write a deterministic equivalent reformulation. This reformulation is a maximum covering problem. So I'm going to write it as a maximum covering problem. 
and it's going to be uh, terrible, not something that we want to solve. Okay, but it still serves as my deterministic equivalent reformulation, which we show that it is indeed um, an equivalent reformulation. Then we're going to write um, a simulation based approximation of this. So we're going to write a sample average um, approximation, but we do not call it SAA as the one that exists already or passed from 2009. We're going to call it SAAA because what you're going to see is that through this maximum covering formulation, we, it is as if we're aggregating scenarios. So the last A is for aggregation, but it is a sample average approximation, okay? It's just that it generalizes the one that existed from before. And once we have this, you're still going to realize that this is not good enough. We will not be able to have something that will scale well, okay? So what we're going to do is that we are going to have yet another reformulation, which we're calling hybrid submodular. So we're going to prove that our, um, uh, and I'm not going to do the proof here, but we prove that the objective is submodular under any random utility maximization model, and we can use this to write a reformulation which we can solve effectively. So this is sort of the storyline. So if you don't want to hang on for the details, then you can sort of eat the pizza and wake up for the results. <laughs> OK. Um, so this is the deterministic equivalent reformulation. So pay attention here compared to what we have before. So we have new decision bears, right? So here we have our Xs, same as before. These are our location decisions, OK? But now we have changed the uh, objective here. So these are our omega p times y of p. So suddenly here we have p's appearing. So this is a maximum covering formulation where the basic unit of demand is a preference profile, okay? And these preference profile are uh, our a um, uh, vectors. So these vectors, um, actually you have one vector for each configuration of facilities, if you wish, okay? So uh, these, uh, um, these preferences uh, profiles represent are, are representing whether we are capturing sort of with our decisions X, um, the uh, demand coming from a particular profile, okay? So this is the basic unit uh, of, uh, of demand. Um, so you can see this intervening in our constraints here. Okay, so YP represent if we're capturing a particular profile. And so uh, our objective now maximizing market share come, becomes this. Okay, now our omega P uh, represent the weight of this profile. Okay, and so essentially what it means is that it's the probability uh, that a randomly selected customer has this particular profile P, okay? This is our WP, so this is our share, and then we will have our captured market share. Is it fine? So anyone would say, this looks a bit hidden. Here I have A, and the, the, the number is two to the power of D minus one, right? Which is not so nice. D is the set of any location that we can open, right? So we have exponentially named many of these profiles, but let's not, uh, uh, right now we're just doing this reformulation, okay? That's one issue. And the other issue that this thing is actually very hard to compute, okay? Uh, excuse me? Yes? The dimension of the A vectors are the number of customers? Uh, no, not the number of customers. These are the number of facilities. This is in, uh, in capital D. So first profile says that uh, it's only for the last facility that is one and so forth. That's why you have as many as you have two to the power of cardinality of it. So um, so where does the customer uh, Yes, where does the customer come in here? Are we treating, uh, are we somehow 
so the customer, if so, what what you're seeing the linking between the Y's and the X. So the X will tell us what is open. Okay. So you're linking these profiles to the Y through what is open in this particular solution, X. And then this share of captured demand links your customers to these preference profiles. I see. So you have one of these for every customer. Yes. Uh, probably. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. So the other one had issues, obviously, because the omegas are hard to compute. But if we are doing a sample a simulation based approximation, we can actually compute them, right? So here I'm showing if we were to do as, a, as a, the SAA, like you said earlier, like we would draw some scenarios for each customer that we have in our sample, in which case we would have uh, the cardinality of N times the cardinality of S of these simulations. And what you can see what changed from before, well, besides the half that this is an approximation, you see now the Y here, they are in P hat instead, the dimensionality. Here we have a sum over P hat. This one has a hat. And here now you see these guys, we have P hat. So we have changed now from going from um, uh, any profile to the profiles that we actually have in some sample P hat, okay? One could just hope that that would be small enough, but usually it's not the case, right? Uh, because uh, for most models that are not trivial, uh, we would still have a cardinality of this that would go to, uh, that would be a two to the power of the cardinality of these. So this is still very large, but at least we have something that we can compute. Okay. How did you know the necessary uh, cardinality for that? I don't know necessarily the, the cardinality, uh, you mean of the for yeah. p hat? Yeah. No, it's just the worst case, right? So if I draw sufficiently many and I have a lot of, and I'll get to that, it's a very good question for what comes later. So if I have a large degree of uncertainty in my problem, I will sample any profile with some non-zero probability, right? So this is the, the worst case, okay? As a small note, the advantage over the, the, the basic sample average approximation is that this one will aggregate under a single profile, all the customers that share the same profile, right? This is why this one leads to a smaller problem than just doing the sample average approximation from before, right? So there is actually some power in these profiles, even though they're exponentially many. Okay, still, like I said, we're not very happy, right? Because oftentimes this will still be, be, be too large solved. So then let's look at some insights on this problem. So what we have is actually diminishing returns. So we can show that the objective function of this uh, uh, problem is submodular under any random utility maximization model. And so this generalizes some results from before because there are others that have observed that this objective function is submodular, but under specific assumptions on the model. But actually can be shown. So what is uh, uh, what does it mean that this objective function is submodular? It simply means that there are diminishing returns, right? So if I look on the top here, um, I have only uh, one uh, location open, the white triangle. And so if I were to open a new location, I will get some marginal increase in the demand that I capture, right? Diminishing returns means that if I start with a set that is larger to open this uh, facilities, and I open the same facility here, I will have a, a, a marginal increase that is lower than the first case. Okay, this is uh, what it means that our objective function is submodular. Okay, so then what we can, we can use this, okay? So what we're going to use the idea 
is to say, okay, we have all of these preference profiles. I've simulated them, so I have a bunch of them. Now I'm going to focus only on the ones that are the most important, okay? Which are the most important ones? Well, these are the ones with the highest weights, right? My omega hat. These are the ones I should focus the most on. So let's assume that I can partition my set P hat and I will only consider a subset explicitly in my formulation. This is my P1. So I have a set, I say, these are the most important ones. I'm going to consider those explicitly. And the others, I'm not going to uh, consider them explicitly. I want to reduce the size of my problem. So I'm going to aggregate those into a single auxiliary variable that I'm going to bound by submodular cuts, okay? And actually this uh, is a reformulation and it follows from, from results in the literature once we have showed that our objective function is submodular, okay? So essentially what we're left with now is a reformulation. I have partitioned my set, P1, P2. I'm saying P1, everything I really care about, the most important profiles, the other ones I aggregate, I'm not going to uh, take them into account explicitly. And this is a reformulation that is very nice from the theoretical perspective, but from any like first thing perspective, from a computational perspective, how I choose P1 actually matters. Right? I want to find a good sort of set P1. And this we have not answered yet. And here we don't want to have sort of, uh, you know, a parameter that I need to tune as a user, blah, blah, blah. So we think like, how do we find a good set uh, P1? Yes. Does it depend on Omega? Uh, how it, I guess you're going to talk about how to create P1. Yes, that's the perfect transition to the next slide. Oh, okay. You let me know if I didn't answer your question when I, I flip slide. Okay, so I'm going to define a set partitioning parameter, right? So this is going to partition my set P hat into two. Are we good so far? Uh, it's clear with the, what the objective is now? Okay. Uh, so um, I'm indexing these uh, observed profiles that I have. I have P hat <coughs> profiles. And I'm indexing them by the way. So this gets to your question, right? So I'm just going to set an index one to the profile with the highest weight and so forth, okay? So now what I need to find is an index that I called I star, which will give me the, the partitioning of my set, okay? Now this is very familiar for anyone uh, dealing with the clustering, right? So here, what we have is actually what we can call the need detection method. So we want to select a cutoff that is appropriate in an increasing function with diminishing returns, right? So this is our function. Here on the x-axis, you have P1 hat divided by, the, so the cardinality of P1 hat divided by the cardinality of P, okay? So it goes from zero if I have, uh, well, actually it's not very, yeah, uh, from zero, if I only, if I consider the full set and um, uh, to one, up to one, okay? And then I'm having a ratio, which I wrote down here, so you don't have to tilt your head, which is actually, essentially the demand that is captured, the total share of demand that is captured by my P1. Okay, so this is an increasing function with diminishing return because since I ordered my profiles to the most important ones, it's going to be increasing sharply, right? Because I'm giving the most important profiles first and then it's going to be slowly uh, uh, increasing but with, with you know, diminishing returns. And so what we wanna find is the sweet spot here, right? So what we wanna find is actually the point where we're maximizing the difference between this curve which is just ii here, and this function here. So it happens that this is the place now, okay? So at this particular point, 10% of the observed profiles account for 54% of the demand, okay? So the larger this difference, the happier we are. 
and I really need to speed up. Okay. So now we can analyze what's going on as a function of this. So here you see um, the number of submodular cuts that we need, how it changes when we go from zero to one. So if we're considering all of the preference profiles in P1, it's as if we're not doing any aggregation. So obviously we have very few cuts to do or zero cuts, okay? On the other hand, in the beginning, we have to do a lot of cuts. And with the circles here, you see the average uh, cardinality of P1. So you can see that it is slowly increasing. And what our knee detection method gives us is this point here, which seems to be a sweet spot for this illustrative example, which is based on data from New York. And this is the CPU time, uh, depending on, again, the same omega. So the average the, we, uh, risk, we get with the uh, our method is 0 0.25, and you can see here what the needle method is sort of suggesting in terms of trade-offs. Okay, so high concentration of the profiles lead to large reduction in problem size. But so then what we were asking ourselves is, can we characterize this level of concentration of the demand profiles? Because then it will give us some sense about the... the uh, the instance that we're facing. Okay. And here, uh, unfortunately, I will um, not go into the details uh, because I don't have time, but the paper provides an information theoretic analysis where we are linking um, the distribution of demand profiles to entropy and, uh, and to a distance uh, measure between our omegas, okay? So it turns out, so this distance matrix, uh, measure is just an L1, expected L1 norm of the difference between our, the true sort of weights and the ones that we have from our sample. So intuitively, this instance should be very small, right? If we're doing good. And it turns out that um, uh, uh, a maximum entropy distribution, so in this case, a discrete uniform distribution maximizes this measure, uh, whereas um, the generate distribution, so as if one profile accounts for all of the demand, uh, is a minimizer. So we have a link between this measure and entropy, and we can also link um, our measure of the delta star. So remember this curve that we have? we can link this to the entropy as well. So this is sort of the analysis. So now we can look at entropy to uh, see whether the instance is, if our um, methods is likely to perform well or not. So here you see an example where we have entropy uh, uh, measured. So it goes from low values. Here the average cardinality of p hat is around 20,000. And the higher entropy, the average cardinality of p hat is around 60,000. So it's quite a big difference. And then you have one curve for each method. So the SHS, what we're suggesting is sort of this dashed line. Um, just doing this sample average approximation with aggregation is the solid line. And the dotted one is just the pure submodular uh, uh, method. That's the one of Ubik and the Moreno. So we can see already, and what I'm going to tell you, because I'm going to go fast on the numerical results, is that SHS works really well up to very high levels of entropy, okay? So sort of this picture is confirmed in all of our comparisons with respect to the heuristics of G, um, G, uh, G, yes. Yes, now I just have a blank. Anyways, um, compared to the heuristic and compared to MOA, which is the exact uh, baseline. So it's very fast. And then for the last part, uh, we get beaten by the heuristic in terms of speed. Uh, and interestingly, in certain instances, the exact method, the MOA, so the, the multi-cut, the outer approximation, performs well on the high uncertainty instances, which means that it could possibly be that one would like to have two alternatives of algorithms to use. 
So, um, questions so far? It's the same time. Every time I same thing. Every time I write, I present the, some new work. I uh, I underestimate the time it takes to present it. So, for the results, um, we have divided them into two. So one is on the conditional perspective because we want to compare to the uh, to the benchmarks that we have in a fair manner. So here we're using an MNL model, which means that we can use all of the methods that use that specific structure of the RUM model, right? So no like fancy random to the maximization model, the most simple one, as if we want to see if our sample average approximation, which should be worse than if you just use the analytical probability, um, how it performs. So that's the first set of results. And the second set of results are new instances than when we're seeing all of these vectors as random. So the theta, the beta, and the epsilon. Okay. So essentially, and this I'm just summarizing, look at the top. We have a parameter that will essentially guide the entropy of the instance. Okay. It will guide the importance of the deterministic term relative to the others. Then we have one uh, parameter that guides the, uh, the attraction of the competing facilities, and we have our budget. And essentially what we're doing is that we are running a lot of instances varying uh, those parameters, okay, considering all different parameter combinations and different sizes of scenarios, okay? And then you would just have to trust me when I summarize the results because we're not going into all of the details, but this is essentially it. So we're varying this beta parameter to see how we're performing it when the entropy changes. In particular, that's what I focused on here. And the takeaways are that as it's almost always the fastest, like I said earlier, except when entropy is high and the optimality gaps are very close to zero or zero. Um, and we are consistently dominating. So this SAA with aggregation is consistently dominating the SAA, which is sort of expected. And what we're seeing as that is that our the empirical the numerical results are confirming the information theoretic analysis that I exposed to you earlier. So uh, these are uh, results for New York instances. So these are very large, it's a very large instance and we're varying the entropy as I mentioned by the beta parameter. So as you move from the top row and downwards, you're increasing entropy. That's the only thing you need to remember. Um, then the second is the relative size of our SHS. So you see it's the P hat cardinality divided by the total. Right, so you see in percentage. So you see that this is a relatively low percentage, but when it gets higher, we get into trouble in terms of what trouble. We get to larger uh, computing times. Here you have all of the computing times for the different methods. Okay, so essentially, we're the fastest up to a certain point, and after that, it's actually MOA. So this was what I was mentioning before that it's interesting to see that. On low entropy instances, it actually struggles, whereas on high entropy ones, it seems to perform well, which is a nice complementarity. Okay, I will not go into these details. Um, I will show that the gap, so if we only focus on this column here, these are the optimality gaps. So remember, we're in a conditional perspective with the MNL, so we actually know the exact optimal solution. So we compare to that. We still have our simulation approximation, right? So we can see that GGX is actually quite good, right? These are gaps in percentage. Um, when we have very few scenarios, um, we have sometimes a bit higher gaps, but for the larger number of scenarios, uh, we have uh, gaps very close to zero. Okay, so if we look now at these generative instances, so here you see just 1,000 customers. So this is the setting of the generative ones. There are three types of locations, three customer types, and 10 competing facilities. And as a takeaway, they still show very strong performance of the SHS um, with gaps close to zero.
So these are just the results for the highest entropy instances. So these are the ones that should be the most difficult for us. When you move uh, down the rows here, you're increasing the number of scenarios. What we need to remember here is that all of the methods need simulation because this is a, a mixture. So there are random parameters in here. So even MOA needs a simulation. Now, those methods cannot, we cannot afford as many simulations because the computing times explode. So we have used different sets of scenarios for each method. So we're using very large numbers, so up to 256,000 scenarios. And with MOA, the largest is uh, 1,200 scenarios. Nevertheless, we can see that in terms of solution quality, if we look here, this is the market share that is captured, which is our objective. <clears throat> we can see that these methods perform very well. We're slightly uh, better on this one. Here we have the same as GGX and so forth. The others are relatively, um, relatively good as well. But in terms of computing time, we're much faster. And this closes my, I will write the conclusion, but before I just wanted to wait because GGX seems like a good option. And we were a bit like, this heuristic is really, really good. And it is really good. However, it's also easy to construct examples where it fails. So it fails if the greedy first step is not a good solution. And it's quite easy to construct <laughs> examples where uh, GGX actually uh, finds quite a poor solution. So what we have suggested is a model-free approach for solving this probabilistic competitive facility location problem. Um, we can do that for our method. We can apply uh, to any RAM model, so it doesn't depend on the structure of that model. And we also have an algorithm that does not depend on any user-defined input, right? We're not asking the user to check different you know, cardinalities of uh, this set P1. We have this new method. Um, that uh, we can use and we can draw parallels with how that method works and um, to, uh, to entropy. So we provide this information theoretic analysis and we show that on some uh, entropy levels, we outperform on other entropy levels, we perform comparative to other, uh, to the benchmark algorithms. And these are actually tough benchmark benchmarks because they have been developed <laughs> to be very good for the MNL. So the sort of conditional perspective first is, is quite tough to be. There are plenty of future directions that we could go into. Uh, one that sort of when it breaks down, this maximum covering formulation that we have is when we have capacity constraints on the facilities. Uh, so this is something that we would like to, and I see uh, <laughs> Pascal is uh, nodding. So this is something that we would like to uh, look at um, and other problem classes. So I think that there are other um, problems, actually uh, choice-based optimization problems where this could apply, um, maybe with tweaks. And there are also other ideas for the methodologies. That was everything that I wanted to say. Thank you. For the knee method that you described, you still need all the probabilities for the scenarios, right? Does that mean you still have to calculate an exponential number of probabilities, or can you do that better in some way? For, for which method? Is so for, for deciding which, um, which scenarios to aggregate and which ones to include in the model, right? Yeah, but I don't, I don't need to... Uh, so I'm just um, computing these uh, weights over my sample, right? Oh, I see. Okay. So now I got a rid of, of anything that could depend on sort of the exact shape of this probability. I'm just assuming that I have a simulator that allows me to draw from this joint distribution of theta, beta, and epsilon. I missed the sample part. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so uh, thanks for the presentation. I'm trying to understand one thing about entropy. So when I think about these competitive problems, you, you're obviously, your utility function sort of is based on knowledge of the competitor's locations, but there may be, of course, other factors that cause a customer to choose one location or the other. 
So when you talk about increasing entropy, do you, do you mean that the, is, is it similar to the idea that the share of variation, that's explainable variation versus random variation is um, less, like you're getting, you're more, you more have unexplainable variation in your utility yes. function? Yeah, okay. yes. so that's, that's covered. Right? Yes. Okay. So you can actually have, you know, your explainable part, if you wish, you can have a bunch of things in there, right? Uh, it can be not only um, sort of about the competitor locations, but it can also be about sort of the customers. And so, so this is very general, like this could- Yeah, 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 I understand. Right? But it's but really- it's also showing that as you have less explainable variation, there are other methods maybe. Yes, which I find very interesting, right? So usually we don't want to do choice-based if you're close to a, say, uh, a uniform distribution here, you have no information, right? So these are less interesting from my point of view, but it's very interesting from a theoretical point of view to look at those, but typically we wouldn't want to use these models if we do have yeah. some information, right? We know that we will always have some uncertainty, hence my beginning of the background, but hopefully these <laughs> models can still do some share of explaining um, the answer. Yeah, reducing the uncertainty, I should say. I have a question about the instances used. You mentioned that you use New York instances, but what like what exact setting are we talking about? What are the locations? What are the customers? Yeah, so this is a this is a good question. So I skipped because this is sort of a, a crazy slide uh, and I lacked up time, but um, this paper here by Holguin Veras explains exactly it's a park and ride location problem. Um, they have a sample of over 80,000 customers and they have about 60 uh, available locations. And so what we do with this is that we play around with uh, the random utility maximization model such that we can sort of test on, on this sort of structure of the problem, different entropy levels. So that's what we're doing with these different parameter configurations. And what we found out actually, we're going a lot broader here than in the literature because some of these settings that have been used in the past actually to very, very low entropy instances. So here we deliberately chose to, to sort of increase the uncertainty to see how these methods are behaving with increasing uncertainty. Other questions? Thank you, Emma. Thank you.